Hi, in this video, let's take a look at this light VNA. I reviewed a nano VNA FV2 on this channel a while back. If you are new to vector network analyzers, I'd recommend you checking out that video first, as I give an overview of what a VNA is and what kind of measurements you can do with it. As I mentioned in that video, there are many options out there in the nano VNA market. This one we're looking at here is a little bit special in that this light VNA covers a frequency range between 50 kHz and 6.3 GHz. Most of the other nano VNAs only work up to 3 GHz, including the nano VNA-FV2 I reviewed last time. If you need the extended frequency range above 3 GHz, this may be the only choice you have within the $100 price range. There are two model numbers for this light VNA, namely Model 62 and Model 64. The one I have here is Model 62, which is provided to me by Banggood for me to do a review. Currently, you can get one of these for just under $100, and I will leave a link in the video description below for those who are interested. The performance numbers for these two models are identical, except that the 64 model has a 3.95-inch LCD, versus the 2.8-inch LCD on the 62 model, and the 64 model also has a larger capacity 2 amp hour LiPo battery compared to the 1.3 amp hour battery included in the 62 version. So your decision point between these two models is really just the screen size. By the way, my understanding is that some older revisions of this light VNA has some issues with the charging circuitry design and causing the unit not to be able to fully charge. I can confirm that the one I received here does not have any of that issue, so they definitely have fixed the issue. Although it is not specified, I suspect that the higher frequency range is achieved by utilizing the harmonics band. This is actually a common technique used in many spectral analyzers and VNAs. And the main drawback is the raised noise floor and the reduced dynamic range. We can see this in the specs provided. If you take a look at the specs provided here, you will see that the system dynamic range is greater than 70 decibels at frequencies lower than 3 GHz. And as soon as the frequency changes to be above 3 GHz, that system dynamic range drops to be just above 50 decibels. And the same happens to S11 noise floor as well. You can see that for frequencies below 3 GHz, the noise floor is below minus 50 decibels. And when the frequency goes above 3 GHz, you can see that the noise floor is also raised by 10 decibels. Interestingly though, the spec did not say whether the system dynamic range is for S11 or for S21. Now it could be that the figures for both S11 and S21 are the same, as the light VNA uses only one mixer, and the signals are routed via RF switches depending on whether S11 or S21 is being measured. When you are using either a light VNA or nano VNA, you really have to set your expectations. At this price point, one big compromise is the dynamic range. As even 70 decibels, it is not that great. And a modern professional grade VNA, for instance, the Mini Circuits EVNA 63 Plus, has a dynamic range of 132 decibels. But it also costs $8,000. But for hobbyists, this performance level of 70 decibels dynamic range is perfectly acceptable for most of the usage scenarios. The build quality is quite good, although the case is made of uh, plastic. It does not feel flimsy, it is rather sturdy. But unlike a metal case, like the one we saw in the Nano VNA-FV2, you don't get the extra shielding provided by the metal enclosure, unfortunately. One feature I like a lot about this light VNA is the inclusion of a micro SD card slot. You can use it to save screen images, which is quite handy. Of course, you can always use computer software such as the Nano VNA Saver to do this. And by the way, Nano VNA Saver works with this light VNA quite nicely. The light VNA comes in in this uh, paper box. Besides the unit itself, you also get a USB cable, some calibration adapters, and of course, you get two of these rather high quality coaxes. And that's pretty much standard stuff you'd expect. Now let's turn it on and do some measurements. 
I have played with it quite a bit, but first I want to show you the firmware version here. If you go to the version, you will see that the firmware used by the Light VNA is made by Dislord, and it is quite feature rich, but it does have a lot of menu items, and uh, beginners can find this quite a bit of uh, intimidating. Since this video is not a tutorial on how to use a VNA, I'm not going to go through all the menu options. I thought I'd measure the waveform 600 MHz to 6 GHz MIMO antenna I reviewed a few weeks back, again using this light VNA. If you recall, I did some measurements on the sub 3 GHz bands with the Nano VNA FV2, but that Nano VNA only goes up to 3 GHz, so I couldn't measure the 3.3 GHz to 6 GHz band. Now I can with this light VNA, so I'm quite excited to test it out. To save some time, I have already done my calibration, so now let me hook up the antenna to the Nano VNA here. And by the way, I'm hooking up two antennas to this light VNA, and I wanted to see the cross-channel isolation characteristics as well. Let me check which band we're currently looking at. Let's uh, recall. Let's recall the first one is measuring between 500 megahertz to 1.1 gigahertz, which is what we're looking at here. And let's change the display a little bit so it becomes more familiar for you. Let's change the format to SWR. And uh, I think let's change the vertical unit a little bit so that we can zoom it out a little bit so it doesn't look this uh, drastic here. And for that, I'm going to see how to do that. I think it's scale. Scale per division. Let's do 2. So basically, each division is SWR of 2. So that should bring it down a little bit. So in fact, we can probably do SWR each division to do 1. Yeah, so this actually looks very similar to what we have observed on the Nano VNA-FV2 before. And according to spec, you can see that the SWR should be within 2.5 for a frequency of 600 to 698 megahertz, but everywhere else should stay under 2. Let's take a look at what we have here. Let me enable the value of the vertical grid so you can see it better. As you can see here, for the first frequency band between 600 MHz and uh, 960 MHz, we are roughly under the SWR of 2, which is what is specified. So this looks very, very nice. And the uh, cyan line here is showing you the isolation between the two cross-polarized channels. And you can see that we are at uh, Worst case scenario is about 10 dB down, but for the majority of the time it is 20 decibels down. So that is very good indeed. So now let's uh, switch to the second frequency band. And for that I'm going to recall from 1.5 GHz to 3 GHz. The frequency band here is actually 1.71 to 2.7 gigahertz, you can see here. So let's uh, find our marker and go to 1.71. This is roughly 1.7, it's roughly here. And uh, to 2.7, which is roughly here. And you can see that between these two points, the SWR actually stayed under 1.5. So this SWR is actually really good, and the unit is actually different than what we had before. So we can change that. Display, scale. Again, let's do one per division. And you can see the SWR is way down here. The channel isolation between the two orthogonally polarized antennas is also very good. You can see that for the majority of the time, it stays under the minus 20 decibel line. Now let's move to the 3 GHz to 6 GHz frequency range, and that's what we're most interested to see, as we were not able to measure that before. So let's move to 3 to 6 GHz. And let's also change the SWR 
Okay, let's change it to SWR view first. Let's go to display and format SWR. And also I'm going to change the SWR actual measurement here to back. I'm going to change the scale to one per division. That's what we have done before. And now you can see that the frequency response of this antenna, the SWR, between 3 GHz all the way up to 6 GHz is also very good as well. It's sitting largely under 2. So that is the spec maximum SWR of the range. And from the cyan line, you can also see the channel isolation here is actually getting better. This is uh, at a roughly averaging of minus 30 decibels. Next, I will do some measurement of a GPS patch antenna. GPS antennas typically receive the L1 signal at 1.57542 GHz frequency and have very acute response. Here I have a 2 cm by 2 cm GPS patch antenna and let's take a look at what the return loss or the SWR looks like. And here you can see the nano VNA sweeping between 1 GHz and 2 GHz and here is the antenna that I just hooked up. And uh, let me tighten it up so it will be stable here. And as you can see here, the center frequency is at 1.54 gigahertz. And that frequency had drifted somewhat compared to the 1.57542 gigahertz center frequency that is specified for the L1. This frequency drift can happen when antennas age or suffer a mechanical shock. And due to the sharp response when the center frequency drifted, as we saw here, its performance will degrade significantly. Now let's open it up and uh, take a closer look inside. The front side is just the LCD. There is not much else to see. You can see the touchscreen overlay here, and uh, clearly it is a four-wire resistive touchscreen. Now, let me flip it over. We can see the other side. One feature I like a lot is that the board designer had put all the headers on the edge of the board. You can see here we have a UART port up here. And down here, we have a serial wire debugging port. You can see that from the SWDO and SWD clock designations here. Right underneath the multifunctional switch, is the touchscreen controller chip, which is a HR2046. Underneath that is the main microcontroller. It is an AT32F403, which is a 32-bit Cortex-M4F microcontroller with onboard flash memory and SRAM. It also supports USB, which is a rather powerful microcontroller. Towards the bottom in the middle here, we have a GS8722, which is a reel-to-reel op-amp. And uh, this tiny QFN chip underneath here is an MDX8641, which is a single-pole fourth-row RF switch. If you watched my previous teardown of the Nano VNA-FV2, you will probably remember that we have seen a bunch of these 8641s there. I think this is not the only one in this light VNA either. But uh, unfortunately, these shielding cans are soldered on and it would be very difficult to remove. So I'm not going to do this in this video. This chip underneath the USB port is a 5351, which is a clock generator. And finally, this larger QFN chip is a 2871E, which is a 23.5 MHz to 6 GHz synthesizer and VCO chip. And that wraps up this video. If you don't have a Nano VNA already and need one, I definitely think this light VNA is something you should consider getting, especially given its wide frequency range up to 6 GHz. That alone opens up a lot of opportunities where it can be used for. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Please remember to give it a big thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel and get notified for more videos like this in the future. I will catch up with you next time.